Routine. That's what it was supposed to be. A routine story. I'd been sent to cover the possible conflict between loggers and environmentalists. As the chainsaws got ever closer to another old growth forest, support to protect the thousand-year-old trees was strong all across British Columbia. The people had another cause to rally behind. Yet unknown to me, nor the loggers fight to keep their jobs that would become the story. Instead, the forest unlocked one of its hidden doors and released a mysterious, evil legend. And now I realize that the dark forests that surround everyone's town survive with their own rules, their own unknown purpose. Maybe I'm being a bit melodramatic, trying to give depth and meaning where none exists. But the events of the past few hours affected my life like nothing before. Like I said, it was supposed to be a routine story. Trees, loggers, environmentalists, we've all heard it before. But in the blink of an eye, my eye, the mundane took a sickening twist. Before I get too far ahead of myself, let me tell you how the events unfolded. It was about 12, 15 a.m. A long day on the road and a late dinner was putting me into Hope, B.C. later than I wanted. Story of my life. Suddenly, through the midnight fog, I spotted a figure standing in the middle of the road. Another darn hitchhiker, always looking for others to complete their journey. That quick assessment nearly cost me my life. And my story. The details become blurred after that. I hit the creature doing 80 kilometers an hour. What I hid is unknown for now. One thing is for sure, it wasn't human. Experts would tell me later that traces of white fur were embedded in my radiator. Animal fur. But I digress. Smoke and pain brought me back to reality, just in time to see it again. At first, I thought it was dead. The second wrong assessment of the night. Slowly, and I recall this with such clarity, the creature calmly disappeared into the fog and smoke. But not before it had left behind a message. What it had left behind was the remains of 11-year-old David Newsell. Naked, decayed, mutilated, almost beyond recognition. The body of this tiny child looked no better than a roadkill. For the first time in my life, I prayed. When the authorities arrived, I could barely give them a complete sentence. They questioned me well into the morning. The first deliberate thing I did, almost upon instinct, was call my editor. I, Anna Brooks, had just set in motion the wheels of hysteria. I later found out that David wasn't the first child missing recently in the valley. Others thought to be runaways were now being speculated upon. Unfortunately, David's parents were the only ones to see the results. David's mother is now in a hospital. The RCMP immediately began the search. Chief Inspector Cron was to be the media's contact. Besides the police, it seemed like every male with a gun also began his search. They were determined not only to kill the Bigfoot, but to totally annihilate it. For the next few days, everything became a target. Paranoia replaced logic. The rules were simple. Anything that moved was shot. The body count of mistaken animals continued to mount. The media exposure soon grew out of hand. Even more frightening was that another young boy had disappeared. Before we had any answers to David Newsell's murder, a whole new set of questions and fears surfaced. What had started as a local Vancouver story about old trees had quickly turned into the news sensation of the year, spread across Canada soon. Combine this with the activists out to protect the senseless slaughter of wildlife, Environmentalists still trying to save the trees, loggers, more police, scientists, even more media. You can begin to grasp the utter chaotic state that this Fraser Valley community was now faced with. The tragic death of young David Newsell had been turned into a circus, complete with crowds, lights, and someone to call the ringleader. I kept trying to convince myself that it was my job. If I hadn't started the story, someone else would have come across the young boy's body. I remembered that at the first chance, I had called my editor. I keep repeating, Anna Brooks, you were only doing your job. Let me get this straight. You accidentally, emphasis mine, had a knife up to that dear old lady's throat because she was going to buy it and couldn't read the brand name? Sounds convincing so far. Well, now I'm wondering, Mr. Jinsu, what kind of deal can you cut me? Get it? I tell you, man, she came up to me first. Regular customer, you know? Of knives? I doubt it. Sure, man. She's the wife of a local butcher, and they were recently robbed, and... Could you move it a bit to the left? Thanks. Anyways, they was robbed and needed to replace some uh, equipment, man. Listen up, man. Just between you and me, this lie is getting way out of hand. I've wasted enough time on your two-bit excuses. All I'm after is a simple confession. So here are your options. You either tell me the truth, or... When an hour passes, these webs will dissolve. At which time, you will find yourself swimming face-first in garbage. 
I highly recommend you decide quickly. Because according to my watch, your time is about... Honestly, I didn't... Ah! Up. Where should I say down? Perfect. Almost one hour to the second. Filth has just met Filth. I have to admit, it was a pretty awesome belly flop. A quick call to the authorities and my business is done here. Call later. And they say the fun has gone out of superheroing. Just when I think I've been in the business too long, I'm rejuvenated by a new burst of creativity. My new motto is, if you can't scare them into honest life, then antagonize them when they're down. I like it. I better get home now. I'm only about four hours late. Mary Jane's not going to be too impressed. Okay, so I get a little carried away playing Spider-Man. Now remember, Peter, you just finished teaching that honesty is the best policy. Oh, think quick. Hi, MJ? You see, I met this knife salesman and... All right. I'm off the hook. Fast asleep like a little baby. I'll get it, MJ. Peter, when did you get home? Oh, just a minute or two after you went to bed. Hello? Parker, you've got exactly 25 minutes to pack, grab your equipment, and get to the bugle. I'm sending you on the Bigfoot story. Well, since you've asked so nicely, I'll be there in 24 minutes. Parker, I'm in no mood for you. Why me? Because everyone else was busy. I hate having to leave my sweetie again. I'll make it up to her when I get back. Being the mature superhero wife, she understands. But on top of all that, she's gonna take the Simpsons in Twin Peaks while I'm gone. One hurried explanation and a taxi drive later. So Jonah doesn't want his paper to be left in the dust with this Sasquatch story. Fine, I can understand. That he chose me to take the pictures, that's a given. But to hook me up with Melvin Gooner as the reporter? This trip could be longer than I thought. Maybe Jonah's trying to torture me. I hope British Columbia is a nice place. It is now the seventh day of this event. My reports will continue to come in on a daily basis until everything is settled. The idea of writing it from my perspective has been suggested by my editor. Since I broke the story, it seems natural to tap my own emotions. I am tied to this in some involuntary way. More than that, I actually created the hysteria. I created it. But my duty is to report the facts to the people of this province and help guide my paper's journalistic duties. Through all of this, I keep asking the same question. Why? What possible meaning can this have on a human level or on a divine level? One boy is already dead, his body viciously abused that forensics still can't determine the actual cause of death. Another boy, Bill Rice, is still missing. Who knows what horrors he's been through? We can only hope that the boy will turn home soon having lost his way in that forest, and that is just a matter of time, before someone finds him. Safe. On the eighth night, things turn horrific. Well, boys, looks like that sighting the inspector received is just another scared farmer. Better call it a night. Sweet mother of mercy. Mitchell, what is it? God, is that the rice boy? The dogs are going wild. Keep them back, now! Cripes! What's wrong with them? Inspector, over here, hurry! I think it's the boy. Looks like the report was right. This is Inspector Cron. I want an emergency crew and all available agents over to the Nichols farm. I mean now! And for Christ's sakes, keep the reporters away! Jeez. I can tell by the remaining clothes it's little Billy Rice. Mitchell, get over to his parents' house and move them before the media gets wind of this. Miss Newsell's still in the hospital with her breakdown. The rest of you boys, we gotta get this creature. I'm not talking in two weeks. I mean fast. In 24 hours fast. Something evil is out there, and it's our duty to blow its brains out. Too dead. Anyone who was a skeptic until now has been instantly converted. People have waited long enough. They want results. Most of the citizens have pulled their kids out of school. At night, save for police and media, streets are silent. People are hiding their emotions behind steel. Others arm themselves for war. The situation has gotten completely out of control. The media are not helping matters in the least. Quite the opposite. Part of the boy's limbs were missing. It seems to be the only worthy fact to us. The media. Hello, sweetheart. How's everything? Peter, I was wondering when you'd call. I'm doing fine. The question is, how are you? Are things as bad as the papers say? Fortunately, they're not good, MJ. Melvin and I are staying in Chilliwack. Everything was booked up in hope. But yeah, things are pretty hairy right now. I don't know how much longer I'll have to stay. I know, darling. Do what you have to do. I just can't stop thinking about those poor boys' parents. Life isn't supposed to happen like this. 
No parent should have to see their child die before them. I know. I saw a few medical photos of Billy Rice. It just... I couldn't take it. I left the room and cried. Big, tough guy Spider-Man. You'd think I'd seen everything, but all I could do was cry. It's okay, Peter. We shouldn't ever get used to the horrors in this world. You gonna be okay? Sure. I think I'm gonna step out for some fresh air. I love you, sweetie. I love you too. Bye. Day nine. Seems like the creature is everywhere again. The town's imagination has torn apart any sense of logic. The beast can't possibly be in eight spots at once. Rumors begin to fly. Maybe there's a whole race of them. Maybe they're biding their time, waiting to wipe out the entire town. A sadistic smorgasbord. Beast devouring man. These thoughts people are whispering. It is no longer a circus. Biblical prophecy has taken its place. My mind is becoming numb. My energy just isn't there. And more importantly, neither is my heart. I need to divorce myself from the brutal slayings of innocent animals just to atone for the actions of one. Think about the boys. They were human. These are just animals. Just animals. Things that can't reason. This madness must stop. Things that act irrationally.